So a lot of the people, I was kind of checking the names as they were logging in. I uh, used to be a resident here a few years ago. Uh, and so it's really nice to be back and, and talking to everybody. Uh, sorry, it can't be in person. Uh, and just a life lesson for all residents listening, even after your chairman's award, does not mean you're done with these talks. Um, like uh, was mentioned, I'm currently serving as the e-cigarette chapter champion for the state of Kentucky. If you've never heard of that before, uh, that's because it's a brand new thing. Uh, basically, that's a, a part of a nationwide campaign by the Academy of Pediatrics to increase awareness and education and advocacy specifically around the uh, topic of e-cigarette use and vaping, uh, specifically on the adolescent and teen population. Uh, and so as part of that, uh, we're doing a lot more outreach and, and uh, obviously that's what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so particularly, uh, again, e-cigarette use among youth. Um, and so without further ado, we'll just go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about a couple of main things today. Uh, we're going to talk about the terminology, epidemiology, and types of e-cigarettes and e-cigarette use. We're going to talk about the harms and hazards of e-cigarettes, as well as some of the appeals to that youth and adolescent population. We'll talk about resources for adolescents and parents to support cigarette cessation, including resources that you can share with them as pediatricians, and then talk about some of the strategies that we can also use to support e-cigarette cessation in this population, uh, including a new topic, which is kind of coming uh, to light, uh, nicotine replacement therapy for uh, those under 18 years of age. And we'll start with just a broad question, right? What is an e-cigarette? And uh, I'm sure everybody listening today has, you know, at least seen these before, whether it's in your patients or just walking down the street or in gas stations or, or vaping shops, which are all over the place. Um, but it's worth talking about because as you can see from this picture, uh, uh, there are many different types. Uh, everything listed in this little picture in the center is a type of e-cigarette. And so they come in literally all kinds of shapes and colors, and, and they have all kinds of names. They, they're called Sigalex, they're called vape pins, mods, APVs, or advanced personal vaporizers, e-cigars, e-pipes, pod systems. Uh, uh, you know, the, the nomenclature and the types are, are ever-growing. Uh, so it's kind of important to, to talk about what are these specific types, where do they come from? Well, all of these follow a, a basic anatomy of, of five main parts. Uh, there's the battery, right? They're electronic e-cigarettes, and so the battery is the energy source. Uh, there is an atomizer, which is typically a heavy metal coil. Uh, this heats up the e-juice or e-liquid and uh, aerosolizes it. There's the e-liquid itself, again, sometimes called e-juice. Uh, you either put it into the device or sometimes it's uh, uh, built in. Uh, this is what contains all of the chemicals uh, that then get aerosolized, including uh, uh, nicotine. Uh, there's the cartridge, which typically houses the atomizer uh, and has the e-juice uh, uh, built into it. Um, uh, this is either built in, like I said, or sometimes a removable component that you can put into the device. And then most importantly, there's the aerosol. Uh, and that's an important thing to kind of talk about right from the get-go is, is really the term vaping or vaping pins is kind of a misnomer because what these produce are not a vapor, which is typically one substance like water that's been you know, vaporized or put into a gaseous state, but rather they create an aerosol. And that is numerous uh, heavy metals and, and chemicals and nicotine all put in that suspended kind of a state uh, that people are breathing in and breathing out. So when we talk about types of e-cigarettes, uh, we'll, it's helpful to kind of just see how they've evolved over time. And there's several generations of these that have now come out. Uh, the first is the aptly named Siga Likes, uh, named so because they look like cigarettes. Uh, they're designed to look like the traditional cigarettes. They're usually disposable and sometimes rechargeable. Uh, either manual or automatic heating elements, meaning either control uh, the aerosolization or just automatically happens as you inhale or puff on them. Uh, common types are, are pictured here on the right. There's blue, there's logic, there's booze, there's mark 10. And you can kind of see they even they will, will come in, in packs like traditional cigarettes. They really are just made to kind of look like cigarettes. The next generation gets a little bit more customizable. These are the refillable tanks. 
uh, generally larger in size, and they have a reservoir that can then hold the uh, e-liquid or e-juice. And so they're very often refillable, reusable, uh, rechargeable. Uh, they have a higher capacity battery and very often have a manual heating activation, so you can really control how much aerosol that you're getting from those devices uh, uh, as you use it. Uh, other common names for these are vape pens or sometimes tanks. You can see in this picture, they still have that basic cigarette kind of design. The third generation is where things start to get a little weird. Uh, these are the modifiable tanks, uh, sometimes called mods or APVs, advanced per personal vaporizers. Uh, you can see from the picture here, um, uh, uh, sometimes they're digital. Uh, they're highly customizable, highly modifiable. Uh, they very often have that manual heating button like we talked about, uh, but you can really change a lot about them. So uh, including the voltage or the power that they use, uh, you can really control how much aerosol you're getting or the, the, the degree to which uh, it is aerosolizing itself. Uh, common examples are Volcano, Apollo, Alien, uh, and they come in literally all kinds of colors and shapes. And then the fourth generation, or kind of the generation that we're seeing more and more of now, uh, are also sometimes called pod mods. Uh, and you can kind of see in the picture here, that's kind of your greatest departure from traditional cigarettes. These are designed to not look like cigarettes. Uh, they look like key fobs, they look like makeup, they look like lipstick containers, they look like USB drives. Uh, you really have to uh, sometimes really know what you're looking for to recognize it as an e-cigarette. Uh, most common uh, brands that you've probably heard of are things like Juul or Puff Bars. Uh, common other ones are Swarin, Fix, Stig, Smoke. Uh, you can see in the picture here on the right, some of the uh, uh, products available now, these are all listed as black or, or kind of shown as black, but again, they come in different colors as well. Um, like we mentioned earlier, uh, the aerosols, you know, the, the main dangerous thing about these, uh, and especially in those later generation e-cigarettes, that third and fourth generation, where you can really change a lot of variables there, it's important to recognize that, you know, two people uh, with the same e-juice solution and the same type or brand of e-cigarette can still be getting very different aerosol products when they use them. Uh, for example, a higher temperature or a higher uh, uh, wattage when you kind of dial it into these things would create a completely different set of thermal degradation byproducts, different aerosol composition and concentrations. A great example of this would be nicotine. Even if you have a low concentration nicotine solution, if you're using this e-cigarette on high power, you may be delivering high amounts of nicotine. Uh, and I think this is an important thing that most youth and really probably most adults don't realize. Uh, not all e-cigarettes are created equal, uh, even if you're using the same type and the same product. Uh, to further complicate things, there's even other types of e-cigarette use, right? Dripping uh, is one of the more popular ones. You can see the picture up there on top. That's where you take a e-liquid. You take apart your e-cigarette uh, and then you put the liquid directly onto that heated coil element. Uh, a recent study showed that about one in four teens have tried dripping uh, and then talk about kind of high power, high aerosolization of, of chemicals. This is basically uh, that to the extreme. And so obviously may increase the amount of nicotine and toxic chemicals being inhaled. Uh, there's also dabbing, which is similar uh, uh, to dripping. Uh, you just have an e-wax solution rather than the e-liquid. Uh, very often, this is in THC-containing products. Um, so the big question next is, why are youth using these products, right? Uh, uh, they're kind of everywhere, but why are we concerned, and why are you starting to use these more and more? Uh, well, there's lots and lots of reasons, uh, and probably uh, one of the biggest ones is they're being marketed directly to that youth and adolescent population. Uh, they come in fun flavors, uh, mint, fruit, candy. Uh, they have a high nicotine content. Some products like a, a Juul uh, have the same amount of nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. Uh, they also use nicotine salts, uh, which allow people to use them more frequently with less irritation, increasing the risk of frequent use or secondary dependence. 
a lot of teens and adolescents uh, report using these products for self-medication, right? They're at home, it's a global pandemic, uh, they have finals coming up, uh, and they feel that the, their puff bar, or their jewel, or their e-cigarette helps them calm down. The flip side is also true. Uh, kids are at home, it's a pandemic, there's nothing to do. Uh, I use this e-cigarette or this THC containing product uh, and I get a head rush or I get side effects that I do like, it's exciting. There's general curiosity, uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, e-cigarettes are everywhere and exposure is everywhere. And you know, adolescents are intuitively curious. Uh, and then there's the fun factor, right? They can blow smoke rings, they can breathe smoke out of their nose or aerosol out of their nose. Um, they can do tricks with their friends. Uh, there's kind of the game factor of it. Uh, so we'll talk about each of these a little bit more. Uh, again, one of the most uh, upsetting things is that e-cigarettes are being directly marketed to you. Uh, and e-cigarette companies are using flavors to do this. They're using social media and posting. Uh, they've offered scholarships in the past. They're using celebrities, uh, sponsoring music festivals and sporting events, uh, have been using television ads uh, in the past. Uh, and, and the scary thing is these are the exact same strategies that we used to see big tobacco companies do in the past to target uh, uh, tobacco products to youth uh, like combustible cigarettes. They're just rehashing the same strategies that, that they've used in the past. Here's a great example of this. Uh, uh, here on the left, we have uh, a advertisement from a magazine or a newspaper for L&M filtered cigarettes. We've got the star of gun smoke. You know, he's a cowboy, he's cool, he's smoking a cigarette. And then we have over here uh, on the right, an advertisement for blue electronic cigarettes with a modern day cowboy showing that they are just as cool to use. Uh, uh, E-cigarettes are also stylish, right? Just like combustible cigarettes were. Uh, if you use them, you're elegant, you're sophisticated. Uh, here is a great uh, picture that I love to show. Uh, you know, here are two pictures decades apart. Uh, on the left, traditional combustible cigarettes. On the right, e-cigarettes. And basically a frame for frame, exactly the same advertisement all the way down to the pose, uh, showing that these are, you know, fun, uh, stylish, hip, popular among the younger population. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, e-cigarettes very often use nicotine salts. Uh, uh, this is different than free-based nicotine. It's designed to uh, be allowed to deliver more nicotine with less throat irritation. Uh, again, if you get less throat irritation from using it, then you're more likely to keep using it. And if you're more likely to keep using it, you're more likely to get dependent, more likely to get addicted, right? Uh, it's a business model. All salt-based e-juice and liquid contain nicotine. Uh, and so some like Juul and Puff, Mar or, uh, Puff Bars actively advertise this, but it's worth noting that a lot of e-juice solutions may have small amounts of synthetic nicotine or nicotine in them and may not list it as a, uh, an active ingredient. You don't always know what you're getting. Uh, again, just another example, uh, nicotine salts, because of their lower pH, uh, uh, are uh, able to be able to uh, uh, be inhaled uh, with less throat and less pulmonary irritation than regular free-based nicotine with a higher pH. And then there's flavoring, right? Uh, just take a second and look at this picture in the background. Um, uh, if you didn't know any better, uh, if we didn't know we were talking about e-cigarettes, it'd be easy to mistake this for the soda aisle, the candy aisle, uh, but all of these products in the back are e-cigarette, e-juice uh, products. Uh, and you can see they come in fun colors, fun flavors, there's cartoons on it. Uh, it's not a stretch to, to imagine how a 13, 14 year old young man or young woman would see this and have their eyes drawn to it, be curious about it. And we know that flavorings are a huge appeal to that youth population. They come in all kinds of flavors that are, are popular. Uh, pineapple party animal, orange creamsicle, mint chocolate chip, uh, 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 pina colada, uh, uh, all kinds of things, which are, you know, probably uh, 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 something that adults would also be drawn to, but uh, hard pressed to say that, you know, again, that youth adolescent population seeing mint chocolate chip wouldn't have some curiosity about potentially trying this. 
In fact, we show that about 30% of teens report that flavors were the main reason they use e-cigarettes. Most youth uh, start using tobacco or e-cigarettes with flavored product, and most youth who continue to use e-cigarettes report continuing to use a flavored product. Not shockingly, the most common flavors are the ones that are sweet tasting, fruit, mint, or menthol, it's kind of the same thing, candy and dessert flavors. And like we mentioned earlier, these are the exact same flavors, the exact same strategies that the tobacco industry has used in the past to attract younger people to tobacco products uh, uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, and e-cigarettes are everywhere, right? Not only are they in vape shops and you can't drive down Bardstown Road without seeing four or five of those, uh, but they're in convenience stores, they're in gas stations, uh, they're in malls, they're in grocery stores, they're on the internet. Uh, these things are uh, easily accessible and, and really uh, uh, saturated in the, in the uh, community. So how many kids are really using these products? Uh, well, the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which uh, uh, is exactly what it sounds like, it's a national survey looking at youth tobacco use, um, showed that between 2017 and 2019, current e-cigarette use by high school students, and that's defined as any use within the previous month or previous 30 days, within those two years, rates of e-cigarette use more than doubled from about 12% to about 28%. Uh, so that's about three in 10 high schoolers in 2019 saying they were currently using e-cigarettes. More shockingly, that same study showed that between 2017 and 2019, current e-cigarette use among middle students more than tripled from about 3% to about 10%. And so that's one in 10 middle schoolers in 2019 reported that they had been using e-cigarettes within the past month. Uh, and, and that's just a outstanding standing or, or shocking uh, kind of statistic. Uh, well, that was 2019 data. What happened last year? Well, the, the same study, that 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey, actually showed that maybe things are getting a little better. Uh, only about 24% of high school students and about 7% of middle school students using tobacco products, as well as decreased tobacco use across the board, which is very promising. We'll talk at the end about some of the things that may be contributing to that. Um, but it's worth noting 2020 was a bit of a odd year, right? Uh, it was a little bit different for everybody. There was a little pandemic going on. Uh, and so the survey, uh, which was typically given at schools, was probably affected by lots of schools closing. Uh, the data that was typically collected through May was truncated and collected through March. Uh, so we kind of have to uh, take that data with a grain of salt saying that, you know, that improvement that we saw may not really be there. Um, Kentucky Youth Advocates, uh, in partnership with the Foundation for Health Kentucky, looked at this specifically in Kentucky. Uh, so at the end of last year, November and December of 2020, they surveyed middle and high school students in Kentucky. They had about 400 kids uh, and adolescents uh, fill this out from 22 counties across the state. And they asked them, what do you think e-cigarette use has been doing over this year with the pandemic? Uh, and, and amazingly, uh, about a third of them said, we actually think vaping has increased. Uh, about 10% said, oh, we don't think there's been any difference. And about 40% said, we have no idea, which I think is probably about right when you ask middle schoolers and high schoolers a question like that. Uh, but it definitely shows you that, that there's definitely some concern there that we may not have made as much uh, uh, headway as we had hoped, uh, and we'll have to kind of see what the next set of data does uh, on the outside of this pandemic. What did these youth think about e-cigarettes? Well, uh, many believe that e-cigarettes are less harmful than traditional cigarettes. And not shockingly, uh, the youth who think that, the ones who think that e-cigarettes are safer or are safe or more likely to use them than their peers who think that they're harmful. Uh, but we as pediatricians know and we agree with the Surgeon General that uh, obviously tobacco use among youth and young adults in any form, including e-cigarettes, is not safe. And this is a, a, another big thing I want to drive home. Uh, safer does not equal safe, right? Uh, we will talk about there may be some argument for e-cigarettes as a safer 
alternative to combustible cigarettes, but that does not mean that they are a safe thing to use. Uh, and I think that is a really important thing that we need to educate not only youth and adolescents on, but also adults on. Uh, 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 E-cigarettes are not a safer alternative. They are just not a safe thing in general. So why? What are the harms of e-cigarettes? Well, to, to talk about the harms, we've got to talk about uh, uh, what's in them. And same thing, we'll ask teens, well, what is in your e-cigarette that they use? Uh, and overwhelmingly, uh, two thirds of them say flavoring, right? Ah, there's some like orange flavor and there's probably some water. Yeah, that's it. Uh, about 14% said, I don't know. And, you know, about 20% knew that there were some other things in there. Uh, uh, I think that phrase, I don't know, is really important. Um, if you've never been to this website or seen this uh, organization before, again, just a, a, a non-biased plug for the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky, they have a great program called I Just Didn't Know. Uh, and it's a really powerful uh, uh, website uh, and series you can go to uh, where they basically present not only teens, but also teachers and parents uh, information about e-cigarettes that we're going to talk about, about the harms and the use and those kind of things. And overwhelmingly, uh, the answer that they get to all of that is, I had no idea. I just didn't know. Again, uh, uh, just a, a plug for education uh, about these products is really one of the most important things that we can get out there because people are just not aware of the, of the, the, the facts behind them. So what is in these e-liquids? Well, teens are right. There's some flavoring in there. There's some other stuff too, right? You can see some of the chemicals in here. And yeah, do a quick Google search and same chemicals found in herbicides, same chemicals found in uh, uh, car exhaust. Uh, there's nicotine, like we talked about. Um, you know, a, a low percentage nicotine does not mean low percentage delivery. Uh, Juul products uh, have as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes, 20 cigarettes uh, at once. Um, and again, very often not FDA regulated. So there may be trace amounts of nicotine in these products and they don't have to list it on the label. You can't always trust what you're getting. Important to recognize that not only are you breathing in these products via aerosol, but you're also breathing them out. Right, so as you breathe out this aerosol solution, there are the same chemicals and heavy metals and flavorings and nicotine uh, uh, that you're exposing the people around you to as well. Um, what about these flavors themselves? Well, we talked about it. There are hundreds and hundreds of types of flavors and brands and to study every individual one and the effects that it has on a human body is impossible. But the ones that we have looked at, even at low percentage solutions, do cause specific inflammatory irritant and cytotoxic effects in the body. Uh, when we talk about the aerosol itself, again, uh, limited data uh, in, in humans about the, the effect that aerosol has. Uh, uh, more and more studies are coming out, but there's a lot of data looking at aerosols on uh, mouse models and animal models. And uh, overwhelmingly, the answer is uh, uh, not good for you, right? Aerosol has been caused, uh, are shown to cause significant lung impairments, decrease alveolar cell proliferation, uh, increases in oxidative stress, impaired pulmonary bacterial clearance, slowed mucociliary clearance in the lungs, increased risk of respiratory symptoms, chronic bronchitis, significant DNA damage throughout the body, um, overwhelmingly just not a good thing to put inside your body. There's even a specific disease associated with the e-cigarettes now, e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury or e-volley. This could be a whole topic by itself, and so I won't get into it, but it's important to show, uh, you know, between August 2019 and January 2020, there were over 2,500 hospitalized cases or deaths throughout the nation associated with e-cigarettes. We now start, uh, uh, know or are starting to think that this is specifically associated with vitamin E acetate uh, uh, in some of these EGOS products. Uh, this is very often found in THC-containing uh, e-juice or e-wax uh, uh, products. So you go to a teen and adolescent and you say, hey, you know that aerosol solution that you're breathing in uh, causes specific cytotoxic effects in your body and DNA damage as shown in mouse models. And they're going to say, oh, my goodness, I had no idea. I'm going to stop using right away. No, right? That means nothing to them. Uh, but what you can say to them is, 
hey, there's really strong evidence that using e-cigarettes makes you cough more, makes you wheeze more, makes your asthma worse. And in some kids, that will drive the message home, especially athletes, uh, especially those with sports-induced asthma, right? If you say, hey, if you're around people who use these products, if you use these products yourselves, uh, this is going to cause symptoms in you. This is going to affect your performance. Uh, sometimes focusing on those things will drive the message home a little bit better. And then obviously one of the main harms of e-cigarette use is they are a gateway product to other uh, uh, tobacco use. Uh, lots and lots of evidence, uh, uh, strong and consistently showing uh, an association between e-cigarette use and future traditional uh, combustible cigarette use. E-cigarette users are almost three times more likely to start using cigarettes than non-e-cigarette users. Uh, this is a huge deal because we have decades of, of progress getting cigarettes away from this population, and now we have a whole new product that is being specifically advertised towards them uh, that is getting them right back into uh, uh, these, these more dangerous products. So what can we as pediatricians do to help with this? Well, uh, all of us, especially those of us in the outpatient world, but really anyone who, who interacts with this population uh, should be screening for it. And we should probably start doing it at a young age, right? Uh, two years ago, 10% uh, of middle schoolers said that they were using e-cigarettes. Uh, so waiting until high school to have these talks, we're probably missing out on a significant proportion of people. So, so really as young as possible. And we need to ask the right questions. Uh, if you, you know, go to an adolescent and say, hey, do you vape? Their answer might be no. Uh, but if you say, hey, have you ever used a puff bar or a jewel? Have you tried dripping before? Do you have friends that uh, have, you know, Mod Pods? You may get a different answer. Uh, and on the flip side to that, you need to be aware of uh, uh, this, this terminology. Because if they ask you a question, you want to know what they're talking about. Right. If they say, hey, you know, I have a friend that uses a jewel and he says that's safer than, uh, you know, uh, my blue electronic cigarette. You want to know what those products are uh, so that you can at least uh, uh, answer that question for them with some semblance of confidence. One of the most important things we can do is just keep resources available, right? It's impossible to reach every kid or to, to talk to every adolescent about these things as much as we try. Uh, but if you have, you know, an infographic in your office or, or things posted on social media or your website, uh, there may be that occasional uh, young adult who sees it and maybe soaks it in or maybe takes a picture of it on their cell phone or looks it up later. Uh, every little bit counts. And this is one of the easiest things that we can do. Um, there's all kinds of things uh, that you can find on the internet and infographics about this. And then uh, on the other side of that, we also need to help talk to parents about this. Uh, remember that I just didn't know not only applies to teens and adolescents, but applies to parents, teachers, adults as well. So we need to educate them about the names and types of e-cigarettes, the prevalence, uh, the health effects. Uh, we need to, you know, inform them that, hey, your kids are uniquely susceptible to nicotine addiction at this age. So their brains are hardwired uh, to, to be addicted more easily. Uh, and then we need to guide them on how to have this conversation. We also need to remember that just like uh, uh, regular traditional cigarettes, there are lots of parents who are using these products. And just like regular cigarettes, we should be telling them the dangers of this. We should be telling them to avoid smoking or using e-cigarettes in the house, in the car, in places where kids are present, not only because we don't want them to see it or, or, or think that it's okay, but two, we don't want them to be breathing in that aerosol. Uh, and if they use e-cigarettes, uh, very, very important, they need to keep those away from kids. Uh, not only because that curious teen and adolescent may be willing to try it, if they try that fun flavor, maybe more willing to keep doing it, uh, but because liquid nicotine, especially in those refillable solutions like we showed in that one picture, uh, may have really high levels of nicotine. And if you have a younger kid, uh, you know, a three-year-old, four-year-old who sees that brightly colored juice on the counter uh, that tastes like mint chocolate chip, uh, and they drink that, they could potentially get fatal amounts of nicotine from that. Uh, and then obviously we want to guide all current users of any kind of tobacco or nicotine product to talk to their doctors about a way to help quit safely. 
Um, so what can we do to help support this, right? We're screening, uh, uh, we're guiding. Um, well, the, there's the five A's model, which I'm sure everyone has heard of before. I won't go into it, but this is a model that has been proven to help guide tobacco cessation talks in adults. Uh, and has also been shown to really help kind of guide that conversation in teens and adolescents as well. So that can at least give you a framework. We need to develop a plan for success with them, right? Set a set quit date, uh, throw away all their products, get their friends and family involved, uh, hopefully have their parents part of this conversation uh, and have them take care of themselves, right? Work on mindfulness, work on nutrition, work on healthy habits and avoid stressful times. Uh, an adolescent is going to have a lot harder time stopping these products the day before their final exams than if you wait for a less stressful time. So set yourself up for success. Lots of resources out there for teens who are using and want to quit. Uh, the top three over here, Truth Initiative, Smoke Free Teen, My Life, My Quit, uh, are all text-based programs or have a text-based component. So uh, teens can just text the number anonymously uh, and then be connected with local support groups and information uh, and counseling and all those kind of things. There's a classic 1-800-QUIT-NOW that everyone's uh, aware of. And then uh, obviously things like behavioral counseling or cognitive behavioral therapy, in-person things uh, have been shown to be a huge benefit, especially complementing online quit programs and increase your, your quit success rate. There are also lots of resources for parents out there. Uh, here's just a handful of them from the Truth Initiative, from the American Lung Association, from Federal Drug Administration, from the American Heart Association. Um, you know, they come in multiple languages. There's online courses that parents can talk. There's toolkits to guide their conversations. Uh, the American Lung Association just came out with a newer toolkit called Get Your Head Out of the Clouds, specifically for parents of kind of middle school age to talk about prevention of vaping and e-cigarette products. Uh, there's a great national program called Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, or PAVE, uh, which is a collection of parents. Uh, it's a national organization. Uh, they are really involved with advocacy and, and working with schools. They even have a podcast that parents can listen to. Um, but what do we do when a patient's not ready to quit, right? Um, you know, adolescents aren't always uh, willing to listen to their doctor. Uh, to mirror the five A's, there's the five R's. Uh, you talk about the relevance of quitting, the risks of not quitting, the rewards, any roadblocks that they may be having. Uh, and then most important, be that squeaky wheel, right? Uh, repetition. Uh, say it over and over. There's no such thing as a wasted attempt. Every time that you talk to them about it, you're going to hopefully make them more likely to consider it in the future. And then uh, very importantly, always offer encouragement and make sure that they know that you are there to help when they decide that they are ready to quit. Uh, but what do we do uh, about that teen or that adolescent who's using these products, specifically nicotine-containing e-cigarette products, uh, who want to quit but can't, or who don't want to quit because they can't? Um, well, we know that that's not really shocking, right? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the adolescent brain is uniquely vulnerable to the rewarding effects of nicotine. Uh, the motivational effects are extended. Uh, they get more pleasure out of it. Uh, they are hardwired to avoid unpleasant things, right? Adolescents don't like to do things that are unpleasant. And so withdrawal symptoms, they're more likely to want to avoid. Like other chronic diseases, addiction worsens over time. Uh, so if you start earlier, you got a higher chance of more addiction or increased risk of relapses or re-addiction uh, for years to come. And this can happen really fast in this population. Uh, you know, experimentation or, or blowing smoke rings and fun can lead to uh, daily use, uh, cravings, which leads to regular use, which leads to addiction. Uh, remember, dependence meaning we're having some withdrawal upon cessation of drug use. Addiction uh, uh, defined as that loss of autonomy. Right? So compulsively seeking and craving uh, uh, these drugs or, or tobacco or nicotine in this case uh, that persists even in the face of negative consequences, just loss of autonomy over the, over the cravings. We can quantify this in the adolescent and teen population. Uh, this is the e-cigarette dependent scale. 
Uh, this is a series of questions where basically the higher you score, the higher the level of dependence that teen or adolescent has on, on nicotine or tobacco. Uh, there's also the hooked on nicotine checklist for e-cigarette users, uh, which uh, is a measure of addiction. It's a series of 10 questions where really any yes or any positive equals some degree of addiction or loss of autonomy. Uh, and obviously the higher the score, the higher the rate of addiction or the higher the severity of addiction. Uh, so we talked about uh, uh, anyone who wants to quit, we should obviously uh, uh, guide them towards resources, guide them towards online uh, or text-based quitting programs, guide them towards cognitive behavioral therapy, social support, mindfulness, nutrition. Uh, but what about those kids who are motivated to quit or want to quit, who are doing all those things but just can't? Uh, again, this is, albeit a, a very low population, uh, hopefully, but but does happen even in my practice. I've had you know at least one or two in the past couple of years, um, and there's a, a a newer idea coming out that we can start to use pharmacotherapy uh, or nicotine replacement therapy for these adolescents or teens. And so before I start talking about that, I do want to make sure uh, it should go without saying, but this is not talking about e-cigarettes themselves, right? Uh, if you take anything away from here, it's e-cigarettes not good for you, right? Uh, so e-cigarettes are not an FDA-approved cessation device. There has been absolutely zero evidence, even in adults, that e-cigarettes are safe or effective in helping adults quit tobacco products. Yes, maybe you have some decreased combustible e-cigarette or combustible cigarette use. Maybe you have some, uh, uh, maybe it's a little safer because of that reason. Uh, again, safer does not mean safe, remember, uh, but there are lots of cons. You know, you're probably going to increase your risk of dual use, right? Concurrent of the two. Uh, you're going to delay quitting and, and you're going to uh, avoid more effective, safer treatments uh, uh, by, by relying on the e-cigarettes. And then there's all the negative health consequences of vaping and aerosolized products that I have spent the past 30 minutes talking about. So what am I talking about when I talk about nicotine replacement therapy? Well, uh, we've all seen these before. Uh, nicotine patches, gum, lozenges, there's even inhalers and nasal sprays. Uh, these have been proven in adults to be safe and effective in helping them quit tobacco or, or nicotine products, um, especially when paired with behavioral counseling like we talked about. Uh, these help address nicotine withdrawal by providing you know, controlled amounts of nicotine, uh, uh, nicotine at levels that are uh, able to be followed and documented uh, without the uh, uh, other toxic chemicals associated with, you know, traditional tobacco or aerosolized e-cigarettes, and hopefully helps reduce some of that urge to smoke and to vape. Uh, so can we use this in youth? Uh, so specifically for those 18 and under? Well, the answer is kinda. Uh, the FDA has not approved NRT for youth under 18, uh, but we can use it with a prescription. Right. So uh, youth can get these things, but they need a prescription from their pediatrician to do it. Uh, there has not been evidence that NRT is effective in helping youth quit successfully, but there have also not been a lot of studies looking at NRT in youth and adolescents yet. Uh, there is some. Uh, they are very often limited by power. You know, they're usually about one or two adolescents at a time. Uh, but if you look at it the other way, there's also not been any evidence of serious harm from using NRT in adolescence. Um, uh, you know, one of the, the, the biggest questions uh, that I had or that I've heard when talking about this uh, with other people um, is the concern that, you know, I don't feel safe prescribing nicotine to a kid. Uh, but keep in mind, we are, we are talking about the kid who is already using, who is addicted, who is having cravings and loss of autonomy. Uh, and so, you know, the flip side to that is, they're going to get it, right? Wouldn't you rather than get it in a controlled, uh, documented form without those other associated negative health consequences? So, so you know, the answer, can we use it is, yeah, we can. Uh, probably a better question is, should we? Uh, well, the AAP has uh, put out a statement uh, uh, that says, given the effectiveness of NRT for adults, and the severe harms of tobacco dependence, pediatricians can consider recommending off-label NRT for youth who are moderately or severely addicted to nicotine 
and motivated to quit. So again, we're, we're talking about a, a small percentage of, of, of teens and adolescents, specifically those ones that have failed other things that are moderately to severely addicted and have a high motivation. What could this NRT look for? Uh, you know, I personally think things like, you know, nasal sprays and, and inhalers are probably uh, are gonna be a little less effective in the youth and adolescent population. Nicotine patches would be a great place to start. Uh, they come in multiple different forms. Uh, you, you put them on your body, uh, they last 16 to 18 hours and basically release a slow, steady amount of nicotine throughout the day to hopefully decrease cravings. Uh, typically, uh, uh, for tobacco or, or combustible e-cigarette users, uh, this is based on the number of cigarettes per day that they're using. And you can extrapolate some of that, right? Uh, we talked about it. One joule is about the same as 20 cigarettes. Uh, so if they're using a joule per day, maybe you start uh, at a little higher concentration than someone who's using a joule every two to three days. Uh, there's really no, no guidelines for this. There's no hard, fast rules. Um, we'll talk about some of the resources available to kind of guide that in a little bit. Uh, there's nicotine gum. Again, comes in, in lower concentrations, two milligrams, four milligrams. Uh, this is used uh, basically more acutely to help prevent cravings. It can also be used as a monotherapy. Uh, so basically, anytime you crave it during the day, you chew your gum. Uh, you have to chew it. You park it in your cheek. You have release of nicotine. Um, the, the downsides to it is uh, a lot of people don't use it right. There's you know higher levels of nicotine that are given more quickly, so a little bit more side effects. Obviously, people with TMJ or dental problems, it's not good for. Nicotine lozenges are very similar. Um, you get a little bit more nicotine, so you get a little bit more side effects. Uh, again, if you're just popping in your mouth and chewing it up and swallowing it, you're probably gonna get a lot more side effects and a lot less efficacy there. So especially in that younger population, you really kind of have to guide them. Uh, so say you wanted to potentially uh, start nicotine replacement therapy for a teen or adolescent, right? You've got that, that low, uh, or that, that, that kid who, who is more of a rare situation, who, who you really think that you can help, uh, what would that look like? Uh, well, obviously you wanna start by discussing, right? A specific appointment to talk about the benefits and the side effects. You'd wanna screen for any relative contraindications to NRT, and so that's more things like uh, arrhythmias or hypertension or heart disease, obviously pregnancy in, in our female populations. Uh, again, they're already getting nicotine, so so plus or minus there. Uh, you want to talk about the proper use. Uh, you want to talk about the medication themselves, the patient preference, the availability, the potential side effects. You got to think about, you know, am I going to do a long-acting form or am I going to do a, a short-acting form or am I going to do the two together, maybe a low-dose nicotine patch with some gum on top of it. And then, you know, you're probably going to have to provide a doctor's note. You're going to have to pro provide a prescription. You're going to have to see this kid at least on a weekly basis to follow this and make sure that, that you know, rates are decreasing. So uh, this is not, you know, something to use willy nilly. Uh, uh, this is something that's going to involve a lot of work uh, and a lot of follow up. Uh, but again, uh, I think it is going to be something that we hear more about in the, the months or years to come. Uh, especially as e-cigarette use continues to rise or become an issue in this population. Uh, here's an example of a uh, prescription. Uh, this is from a colleague out in California. They use it at their clinic where unfortunately they see a lot higher rates of uh, addicted teens and adolescents. And so you can see, you know, you, you fill it out and then you, you write for your nicotine patch uh, with a plan to use it for a month with potentially a refill. And then you go down a level over the next month with hopefully weaning it off and then some gum on top of it that you can use at a set amount of times per day for a set amount of time and then decrease that as well with the hope of uh, tapering off completely. Uh, so general considerations just for pharmacotherapy just to, to rehash what we just talked about. Um, uh, uh, we may consider off-label use of pharmacotherapy specifically for adolescents who are moderately or severely addicted to nicotine. Uh, this decision depends on the individual patient's needs and the physician's comfort in doing it. Uh, as pediatricians, before starting it, we need to make sure that we are uh, aware of the clinical drug information uh, uh, as well as you know, contraindications and side effects so that we can manage this appropriately. And overall, more studies are still needed to evaluate the benefits and harms of medications uh, to help youth with tobacco cessation. Uh, but I really feel like this is probably going to be something that we hear more about uh, with time to come.
Uh, to wrap up in the last little bit, I just want to talk about kind of what are our current policy priorities, specifically in the American Academy of Pediatrics, in regards to e-cigarettes. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to look two years ago, the AP uh, uh, listed six key public policy recommendations that, that they wanted to see done uh, uh, pertaining to e-cigarettes and similar devices. Number one, uh, in 2019, they said the FDA should regulate e-cigarettes and raise the sales age to 21 years of age. Well, later that year, December of 2019, federal tobacco 21 laws were passed raising uh, the purchase age for all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, to 21 years of age. It's worth noting that this puts the onus on the retailer, right? If they are not carding, they are going to continue to sell. It's only really enforced through fines, uh, so not all places are, are, are doing this. Uh, it hopefully protects adolescents from getting it from their older friends, uh, but if they know someone in college or have a sibling or someone in college, they can still get them uh, by having someone purchase it for them. Number two, they said uh, we should reduce youth demand by banning flavors, including menthol. We talked about it. Flavors are one of the main reasons kids use these. Well, again, about a year ago, a flavor ban was announced in January 2020. Uh, this banned all flavors except menthol, uh, which is a bit of a bummer. Remember, what's, what's one of the most popular flavors? Mint. Mint is basically the same thing as menthol, so that's still out there. Uh, it also excluded all e-juice refillable solutions. It also excluded non-refillable disposable devices. So really, this flavor ban just affected those cartridge-based products like, like Juul and Puff Bars. Uh, again, uh, uh, this is from the FDA, but it is not really well enforced. If you go to some vaping shops or gas stations, you can probably still find these things. Um, we should also ban, uh, number three, internet sales of e-cigarettes and e-juices. Uh, again, uh, just recently, uh, December 27th of uh, last year, uh, uh, former President Trump signed the Coronavirus Economic Relief Package into law, and part of that was something called the PACT Act, which specifically talked about e-cigarettes. And so that PACT Act, or Preventing All Cigarette Trafficking Act, said that within 120 days of signing, so by April 27th of 2021, online vaping retailers must start to follow some new regulations. They have to register with the U.S. Attorney General. They have to age verify their customers. They have to use private shipping services so they can no longer mail products through United States Postal Service or USPS. Uh, they have to uh, uh, fine and, and tax things based on individual states' uh, 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 laws. They have to register with those tax administrators, and they have to keep at least five years of data. Uh, I'll tell you, most of these companies will probably not do this or be able to do this. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the upcoming kind of month or so. Uh, UPS uh, uh, says, or, or just said a couple of weeks ago that, that as of April 5th, they will not ship vaping products anymore. Uh, and so hopefully this will be a big blow to these companies. They'll either have to find their own private shipping options or uh, uh, hopefully just discontinue online sales. And that said, uh, these companies are uh, smart, right? They are in the products, or, uh, uh, in the business of making money, and they are good at finding loopholes. Uh, so this is an article from the Wall Street Journal earlier this month, March 2nd, uh, Puff Bars, uh, which had previously been told by the FDA to stop selling their products, uh, has recently restarted selling their products online uh, because they say, they don't contain tobacco. They contain synthetic nicotine, not tobacco-based nicotine. So they are exempt from all of these laws. Now, the FDA is looking into this, but it just shows you uh, uh, for every two steps forward, there's always going to be a step backwards. Number four, we should ban e-cigarette advertising in place where youth can see it. Uh, lots of work to do there, right? Uh, you can find them advertisement in any store. There are billboards, there's social media posts. This is one big area we continue to work on. Number five, we should tax e-cigarettes at comparable rates to conventional tobacco products. Uh, kind of a small slide here, but you can see Kentucky at least is in the process of doing this. Uh, taxing wholesale e-cigarette products and juices is also a, a per cartridge tax. Uh, uh, this has been shown with, you know, traditional tobacco products 
uh, to decrease use. So, so we'll hopefully help uh, decrease e-cigarette use as well. And then finally, uh, we should incorporate e-cigarettes into tobacco-free laws and ordinances and places where children spill, spend time. Uh, in other words, uh, you can't go to a federal building and smoke a cigarette. You can't go to a, a federal building and smoke an e-cigarette. Uh, uh, you can't smoke a traditional cigarette in a, uh, a restaurant or in some parks, but in some restaurants and some parks, you can still smoke or still use electronic cigarettes. And so we really need to enforce uh, those anti-smoke uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, laws and ordinances to apply to aerosolized or e-cigarette products as well. Um, finally, some additional resources for everybody. Uh, everything that I have talked about today can be found online on the AAP's website. The AAP Richmond Center has an online e-cigarette curriculum. Uh, the majority of the slides that I use today actually came from about five or six other presentations. Uh, so a lot more information about NRT, uh, about screening, about epidemiology of these products. Uh, uh, definitely a great thing to check out. Uh, there's also some uh, uh, packets and informa information there. Uh, for example, here's one on NRT for pediatricians talking about, you know, what NRT is, contraindications, types of NRT, dosing guidelines for the adolescent population, lots of good resources there. Uh, for any pediatricians wanting to work with educators or youth or school settings, all kinds of things you can find online about programs that already exist to help guide you there. I won't read all of them. Uh, and then for anyone interested in getting more involved with tobacco control advocacy, either at a local or state or national level, uh, you know, please reach out to me, uh, reach out to the AAP. Uh, uh, you can look into the American Lung Association. Again, that Parents Against Vaping e-cigarettes uh, is a national program that is always looking for assistance, especially for medical providers. Uh, and then finally, there's an upcoming webinar from the AAP's Richmond Center, uh, April 23rd from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, Central Time, uh, again, talking about assessing and addressing adolescent e-cigarette use. Uh, so if you want to hear more about this, register for that as well. You can just Google, uh, uh, you know, uh, AAP webinar, you should be able to find it. Uh, so key points today uh, to wrap up with just a couple minutes left, uh, e-cigarettes and their terminology are highly varied and highly customizable. As pediatricians, we should be able to use this language and this terminology so that we can understand our patients and so we can ask appropriate questions. Uh, the use of e-cigarettes by adolescents has risen to epidemic levels. Yes, maybe it's getting a little bit better. We hope it is, but it is still not at an acceptable level. This is particularly because advertising and flavorings are especially act attractive to adolescents and being advertised directly towards them. There's a lot of work to be done to address that. Uh, E-cigarette aerosol contains numerous toxic chemicals, not just flavoring. They often contain nicotine. We should be screening all patients and helping uh, them plan for successful discontinuation, hopefully at a young age. Uh, again, it's never too early to start asking these questions or talking about this uh, topic. We know that youth are uniquely vulnerable to nicotine addiction, uh, though the evidence for adolescent nicotine cessation uh, is limited at this time. But particularly for those uh, uh, moderately to severely uh, addicted and very motivated uh, teens and adolescents, pharmacotherapy should potentially be considered. Uh, lots of references. Again, this is based on a much longer presentation, so I'll just cycle through those. Uh, but that does leave us just a couple of minutes uh, for any further uh, questions or comments. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody uh, listening today, and it was a joy to get able to, to talk to you guys again. All right. Okay. I, I have a quick quest, quick question. Um, I'm Stan, Stan Lee Lee. I'm one of the pulmonary fellows. Uh, and I have the, done quite a bit of research on Ivali. E um, and a couple of things from your presentation. It's a great talk, and, and you kind of went over the AAB guidelines really well. Um, I think number one, for that you mentioned, like addressing the right question to the adolescents, I think very important is to kind of win them over and, and establish rapport and trust with the patient. 
And I think what my success with Evali is trying to get them out of, get the parents kind of out of the room and having a one-on-one -on -one with the kid, not really judging what they're doing because it's so commonplace and kind of slapping the wrist with it doesn't really help. But more importantly, I actually came across the European or the UK guidelines on vaping as I was re reading, um, I was trying to read a manuscript the other day. But the RCOP, the Royal College of Physicians in England, have such a lighter stance on vaping compared to America. Um, and, and they don't even mention E-Valley because it didn't hit them as much. Um, and they use it as a positive for smoking cessation, whereas when you go to the CDC website, it's like, no, absolutely not. So I wonder if there is a geographical bias between the countries um, and, and I guess the rest of the world, because vaping is used as a smoking cessation tool actively in England right now. So, you know, I would, of course, this is not going against the AAP guidelines or that e-cigarettes is actually good, but like, I would just like to invite everyone to, to kind of open our eyes to see that the rest of the world doesn't really see e-cigarettes kind of as big because I think it's because we got hit with the value. And I would like your comment on that. Yeah, and, and so I think the, the first thing you said is, is certainly really important. Obviously, anytime you can get a teen or an adolescent by themselves to have this conversation, uh, you're gonna increase the, the chances of having an honest, uh, 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 you know, talk with them. Um, you know, prior to even becoming this, I was part of a, a, a study with the AAP doing some screening, particularly in the adolescent and teen population. And I think you're right. Um, uh, a lot of times, even if you just ask the question differently, right? Not are you using, but hey, you probably have some friends who are using, right? Uh, you're going to get a lot more uh, honest answers there. And it's really, you know, it, even if they're not admitting it to it, it's really just, like I said, increasing that education. Um, as far as the e-cigarette use, yeah, you're right. It is very different in, in Europe. Um, the, the flip side to that is they actually do have some regulations that we don't have, uh, particularly around uh, concentrations of nicotine allowed to be in e-juice. They actually cap it, uh, whereas the United States, we don't. They usually cap it, I think, around 5 or 7%, uh, whereas we can go higher. Uh, it's not FDA regulated. Um, and, and that's interesting. I've not heard that, you know, the... Evali as a as a reason for that, um, uh, you know. Again, it, it, you you can argue that that e-cigarettes are a safer alternative, right? You're not going to get some of the carcinogens and things that you're going to get from traditional tobacco products. Uh, but I think, especially, uh, uh, you know, for two reasons. One, uh, you, you are going to increase risk of dual use, and again, these are not safe products. Uh, uh, and and so, like that, you could probably argue it either way, but. Uh, wouldn't you rather than use something like NRT where you're going to hopefully eliminate all of those inhaled things or, or even chances of Ebali? And then two, uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the, the whole argument for saturation for adolescents and teens. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword, but if, if we encourage adults to use it more, uh, there's going to be more exposure for, for adolescents and teens as well. Um, and we know that, you know, a, a lot of teens and adolescents are, are familiar with, you know, smoking bad, tobacco bad, you know, dare is, is you know, products like that are, are started as young as fifth or fourth grade. Uh, but e-cigarettes, uh, there's that common misconception that they're a safer alternative and, and they almost serve as kind of a gateway. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a good point, but I'm still hesitant to, to say, I kind of agree with the AAP that I'd much rather just have e-cigarettes gone as a thing uh, rather than use them as a cessation device. I agree. I think e-cigarettes should be eliminated if possible. But I also, you know, for our patients and, you know, these adolescents, you tell them to stop smoking e-cigarettes. What are they going to do when they leave your office? They're going to pull out their jewel and they're going to take a hit. So I think like, sure. I, I know I'm taking up time, but like meeting them in the middle is very important. It really works. Um, meeting them at like <laughs> what, be smart about it. Like, be smart. What do you think is a smart idea? Instead of like, hey, no, because this is what we do. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think absolutely. it works for my yeah. patients in that way, too. Absolutely. Great job. I agree with you. Thank you. Um, uh, and thanks for, for letting me know about the Evali stuff. Um, and then I'm just looking at the little chat. Uh, uh, there was a question uh, from Dr. Zavar, uh, relationship between vaping and SIDS. 
Um, I'm actually not uh, uh, familiar with uh, any association between vaping and SIDS. Um, that does not mean that it doesn't exist. I'm just not familiar. So uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, let me uh, look into that and then I will uh, either contact you back or, or send something out through the program uh, if I can find any information about that or if anyone else has read anything about that product uh, or, or about that topic, I'd be interested to hear it. But I, I just don't know that SIDS and, and e-cigarettes have been particularly looked at. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments, or uh, uh, again, I appreciate everybody uh, listening in today. I know we went, we're, we're just over time. All right. Um, I think in the interest of time, we can go ahead and conclude going around here. Thanks again, Dr. Birkin, for an awesome talk on um, and such an important topic. Um, if anyone has any um, further questions or comments for Dr. Birkin, feel, feel free to funnel them through our office, and we will get them to him and connect you guys offline. Thanks again, and have a great day. Great. Thank you all.